For the past two years, I have been spending time with a group of extraordinary teenagers from this church, with our class of compromands who next Sunday will be confirmed by the bishop. It has been such a privilege to be with them. Thursday of this past week, we had our, our final class. Um, and, and I have to tell you, uh, it was bittersweet. Um, it, it, it was sweet because of how much ground we've covered, and, and it was a bit sad because it's our, last, it's our last class as a group. Two years ago, this group came together, and, and they were different in so many ways. They were different grades. Some were ninth graders, some were tenth graders. They came from different schools. Uh, I'm going to take the risk um, and, and try to remember them all. So uh, East Greenwich, North Kingstown, South Kingstown, um, uh, the Met School, Coventry, Tollgate, LaSalle, Wheeler. How am I doing? Did I do it? Did I get it all? What's that? Moses Brown. Uh, no Moses. Was there a Moses Brown? There wasn't a Moses Brown. <laughs> Don't confuse me. Anyhow. So anyhow, they came from different schools. They came from different zip codes, different neighborhoods. They had different interests. And, and to be very clear, they also had different beliefs about this God business. Two years ago, they they were so different in many, many ways. And yet, last Thursday, as we, as we talked about, so, so what's, your, what's your takeaway? What's been the meaning in, uh, of this class? They said the most beautiful things. I, I won't share with you all of them, but a few I do want to repeat. One of the things that, that several of them said is that, that this became a safe place for them to ask questions about faith. We all need that kind of place, don't we? And they also said, this became a safe place for me just to be me. <laughs> we need that too. They, they, talked about, they talked about, well, how can we keep the band together when this is all over? Mm -hmm. I love it that they want to do that. Um, someone said, someone said, you know, I have come to care about every person in this room. And I looked around the table and the heads were nodding. It was just great. And yet, and yet maybe the most, in some ways, the, the most goosebump inducing thing that was said was when one person said, by virtue of this experience, I've come to learn the power of community. I have come to learn about the power of community. I had goosebumps and some tears too. So here we are, the final Sunday of Easter, seven Sundays of Easter, the last Sunday of Easter. Next week it's Pentecost. The last Sunday of Easter, and we get this reading from John, this, this brain cramping reading from John. I mean, look, I love parallel sentence construction. I'm married to an English teacher. She's very good at that. But I gotta tell you, this gospel that I just read, I mean, were you paying attention to it? Am I the only one who found myself sort of tied in knots by some of the parallelism here? Um, uh, glorify your son so that your son can glorify you. Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And shall I go on? Did you get that? Right. That's, that's John. That's classic, classic John. So the scholars have come to understand this passage of John as, as Jesus' sort of high priestly prayer. To give you a sense of, of context, these words are spoken just hours before Jesus is to be crucified. He knows that his time on the earth is coming to an end. And, and he's offering his final intercessions to God with, with his closest followers there to listen. And in these words, 
What is captured is, is the heart of Jesus' ministry and message and also the greatest hope that Jesus has for his followers whom he will soon leave behind. The heart of, of, of his message, at least as John sees it, is, is that people should know of the love of God through the love that Jesus had for them. They should know that Jesus and God are one and that that love that Jesus shares with them, that is the same love that God holds for them. He hopes that that's not lost on his followers. And his greatest hope his greatest hope we get in the final line, it's interesting, it's not, it's not that you believe that I am the Christ, it's not that you do X, Y, or Z. His greatest hope is in that final line that we read, which is that you all may be one as I am one. That you all may be one as I am one with the Father. That's his greatest hope. That we all may be one. With that gospel sort of playing in my mind, and the experience Thursday of our confirmation class, I thought, you know what? This confirmation class, they are the answer to Jesus' prayer in the snapshot form. They've become one. They have become one. They've become one with each other. And I would even argue, to sort of push it out by extension, one with Jesus and one with God as well. They have become one. But let me be very clear about something here, because I don't want to misrepresent them. Uh, they have become one not because, not because they've read John's Gospel. <laughs> Not because they've memorized the creed, not because they have gone through all of the catechisms of the church, not because they believe all the same things, not because they believe all the doctrine that, that we talk about. They've become one by virtue of the relationship that they have shared. They become one because together they have experienced kindness and compassion, patience and forgiveness, joy and love. They become one because they have been present to each other. And in all of that experience, I think that they become one with Jesus who's walked before us and with the God who is of us.